You want to switch? Yeah. Okay. That's good. good. That actually. I will let you know if I want to switch. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I'm good with you. There's supposed to be an opening in the intersection of analytical. So the, some of the labs should open up if you want to move. Another analytical right. lab section? On Monday. That's oh. big. So. That's big. Well, I can't take the one on Monday because I'm working stress, so. Try to process control on Wednesday. So I want to even take analytical lab on Tuesday or Thursday, so it's like back. You okay. only have process control lab on Wednesday. Right? So no way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's literally like one lap. It shows up on your table? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. I didn't know that. Let's have to go. Maybe it got cold there. Hey, dang, there. It's a... Well, it's not it's connecting. Uh, it going from the link that you gave me. Like this class time is supposed to And it's loading Wednesday. Like the next Wednesday. Oh. Okay. Give me just a minute. I'll figure this out. So this class goes till 2.30, right? No. Not quite. Well, it's actually 1 o'clock. <laughs> I know that's not true. <laughs> one fifteen to one forty-five, somewhere in between there. Sounds good. Do what? One thirty is fine, too. <laughs> so let's see. Fall break's over. Thanksgiving's coming up. Is this a big test week? Or is um, that? No. No? I'd say it's pretty popular. It's just the same. Yeah. They wait till after Thanksgiving. Finals are when? The second week of December or the first week of December? For, so yeah, they start the first week of December. Okay. On that Thursday, I believe. So it's coming up right after Thanksgiving break. We get right to it. Sweet. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> My daughter's a freshman at, OC, at OCU down in Oklahoma City. She's musical theater, so it's not as technical, but she's like first year freshman, and I'm like, I told her at fall break, I said, now, it's all been fun and games, but when you come back, expect that your professors are going to wrap it up. And, and she's like, she called me a couple of days. She's like, yeah, they got a lot more, like, serious. And I'm like, uh-huh, because they know they got eight weeks left to get you ready for the next semester. And so I remember those days. It's been a while, but. Yeah, whenever I was a freshman, I was not ready for finals week at all. Yeah. Like, like I just assumed it'd be just, like, another test. Or, like, it'd be, like, high school, like, you paid attention all year, you'd be fine. Yeah. Not the case at all. So like my brother's a freshman this year and he's like, dude, I only have four more weeks of school left. I was like, yeah, and two weeks of finals. And that's like six Hell. weeks in and of itself. So yeah. don't overlook that. That's what I told her. I said, when you come back, they know they've got like four weeks and then there's a break and then finals. So they're going to cram everything they can into those four weeks, be ready. And I think the, they have ratcheted it up a little bit. So she's, she took my advice at least. Because it's really easy to come back from fall break and be like, oh, I'm going to relax yeah. for the rest of the week. And the professors are like, no, you're not. So are we getting there? Yeah. Okay. We have a backup. Or I'm also sending it live to YouTube. So if okay. this doesn't work, I have a backup. So that's driving the camera. What's that? That computer's driving the camera. Well, or the camera. The camera's driving this encoder. Okay. And then um, it goes through GoToMeeting to them. Okay. See so if you guys enjoyed this class so far. Learned something. Working on the pro I guess the projects are. Wait, well, you got three weeks left, and then projects you have to get done. I was looking at that. I was like, oh, eesh. none of those look like fun topics. <laughs> yeah. You have a couple more minutes. Yeah. I have to go and I just.
Oh, you're fine. I shouldn't, but thank you. What's my what's my window here? Right Just here? Yeah. Okay. That works. Yeah. All right. And here we go. Quick. I'll move around. I'll go on the back. Yeah, I gotta go that way too. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Brock Peoples, so I worked at give you a little bit of background about myself so you're not listening to a complete stranger. Um, I've worked at John Zink for, it'll be six years, I guess today, seven years today, actually. Um, the majority of that has been in the flare, our flare gas recovery group as a sales and applications engineer. Um, I worked as the director of that product group for about a year and about six weeks ago moved into our ETI product group, which ETI is more focused on upstream oil and gas production type equipment. But um, and Aaron Katz is here with us today. He's our new director. Um, so if you were to take this class again, it might be him that's teaching, but uh, it's me today. Um, before working at John Zink, I worked for 14 years at Baker Hughes in the um, completions product line. So all my experience has been mostly in the sales or design side of engineered equipment. So um, it's a little bit about my background. Um, I've got four kids. I, my oldest is a college freshman, so um, I get to hear stories about college and it brings back a lot of memories. So anyway, um, today's topic overview is flare gas recovery. So you guys have talked a lot about combustion products and you heard Brandy last week talk about biogas flares and the majority of this is we're taking gas. So this week's lectures, both mine and the one on Thursday will be recovery products. So instead of flaring or burning the waste gases, we can recover those and use them as fuel or for some other use. So we're going to go over a short introduction. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how the systems are designed and some of the selection criteria for different pieces of equipment, uh, special application in offshore um, work and some of the attributes there. And then I'll show you some pictures of systems we've done so you get a feel for the size and scope of what this might look like. And then at the end, we kind of wrap up with a little case study that I can walk you through like, here's the information we got from the customer, here's what we did, and this is what the end result was. So a little bit about John Zink's experience in flare gas recovery. We first started these systems in the late 1970s. Um, we've done about 100 systems, give or take, over the course um, of that time. Um, gas recovery has been much more um, popular and applied in the last 10 years. Um, because of EPA and different government regulations, the refiners and petrochemical facilities have had to put in gas recovery systems. And so we've done half of those systems in the last 10. And a lot of times what drives flare gas recovery is the EPA, you know, does a consent decree where they're, they want a facility to reduce their emissions. And the way they do that is basically through lawsuit and suing them to put in a gas recovery type system. Um, so there are laws and regulations that limit how much you can flare. And so as petrochemical facilities want to bring in or grow their plant or change a flare design, a lot of times to get their new permit, the EPA or the Texas Department of Quality will force them to put in a gas recovery system. So we've done about, um, do systems all over the world. The biggest market coming up in the next 10 years is probably going to be Saudi Arabia and, and various offshore markets as they have tighter regulations. Um, and the, so what we're, and we'll get into this, but our discharge pressures range from anywhere from 
18 pounds up to 900 pounds, depending upon what the customer is wanting to do. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit on the next couple of slides. So what are the benefits or why would you do gas recovery systems? It reduces our um, pollutants, NOx, CO2, CO. Um, it eliminates any atmospheric vents. So a lot of times in, in offshore applications, presently they're venting the atmosphere. And it creates either a hazardous situation or just a not desirable. And so they can recover that instead and use it as fuel. So if you're using it as fuel, it reduces your, your purchase fuel costs. Um, it can reduce your flaring. A lot of times it reduces your flare life or increases your flare life. So a flare, you know, is designed for its max emergency relief. And so when you're operating it in a turndown condition of just small vents here and there, that's really hard on the burner. And so they'll burn the flare burners up with the daily emissions to the flare. And so that's an area where flare gas recovery can extend the life of the flare. Um, and then it reduces some of your consumables as well. And it increases the public image. So when the public looks and sees a flare burning all the time, it always, well, what's going on there? And if we can turn that flare off, um, it, it takes away one of the major drawbacks. If you've ever seen a large facility down in like the port area in Houston or, or Louisiana, they'll have these large flares that just burn continuously and it, it really catches your eye, much like the picture shows there. If that was going off in your backyard, you would definitely notice it. And so by eliminating that, we can be a better neighbor. So here's a typical system without flare gas recovery. We've got all the processes in the plant are coming into a flare system. There's a knockout drum, and then downstream of that is a liquid seal, and then we go to the flare. The liquid seal is a pretty important part of the flare system. It provides back pressure on the system, but also keeps oxygen from being drawn in and into our flare header and maybe some of our combustion processes within the facility. So typically without flare gas recovery, you're going to have a six inch liquid seal. Um, it's just enough water to keep pressure from backing up into the system. And we'll talk about considerations for the liquid seal when we talk about flare gas recovery, things that have to be put into place. So with flare gas recovery, now we're changing our liquid seal design to where we have a 30 inch back pressure and we're putting in this recovery system. So all of our gas that would be going to the flare gets recovered. It goes through a compressor and then it goes back to as recovered gas back to use as fuel. So this is a pretty simplified process flow diagram for a very generic liquid ring type flare gas recovery system. And we'll go into what's this. So this box will change as we look at different compressor types, but in general the process is we draw it, we compress it, and we send it to recovered gas. So are there any questions on the process in that regard? And so what's going to happen is basically everything that would be going to the flare is going to go to the compressor up to the compressor's capacity. So one of the aspects we look at is it's real easy to look at that as a flare, a liquid seal, and a bunch of equipment. But there's really a process and a system that goes on here. So we kind of look at this as a system approach with the first being is you've got to gather the gas. Well, figuring out how much gas you've got coming and how big your system needs to be is a really important part of that. And then we'll talk about selecting the compressor and the equipment. Then what do we do with the gas we recover? We may need to treat it or um, do something else with it before it goes to fuel. And then we have to tie it into the rest of the facility. So the rest of this presentation, we'll talk about the gathering stuff. Then we'll focus on the compression. I'll talk a little bit about the, um, downstream, the processes downstream of the compressor and then what we do with it and how we integrate with the rest of the facility. So this is a actual data from a facility for a flare flow over the course of about three months. So this is the gas that's going to the flare. You can see we've got a couple peaks where we had a major event there, a major event here, but day in, day out, that's what's going to the flare. And I know from where you are, that's probably hard to read, but this bottom group here is about 1,000 um, ACFM, 2,000, 3,000. So if you were looking at that, what size, if you want to recover that, what do you guys think would be a good capacity for your system? 
Any, anybody want to hazard a guess? Any thoughts? A thousand? A thousand might be good. So what happens if we get to a thousand, we're going to have some of these events aren't going to be recovered, but we're going to get all this stuff below that thousand line, right? So that'd be, that's a good, a good guess. You know, you might look at it and go, well, I want to do, I want to make sure I get all of it, right? So now we're putting in a huge system. And that's not very commercially practical, is it? So one of the things we can do is, is we look at this data and run a statistical analysis and say, well, OK, what percentage of the flaring events can I recover with a set capacity for my system? So I can look at this and say, OK, well, it, I get 100% recovery at 2,000 ACFM. That's this line here. And then, so anything bigger than that, yeah, I've still got some incremental returns, but it doesn't make sense. So that's probably a pretty good spot to choose. So for this particular example, we would have selected two 1,000 ASM compressors. And we would have operated one of them about 100% of the time. And the second one would have operated about 40% of the time. And then by you get to the third, it's never going to come on. So this is an on-time percentage. So we're kind of looking at a statistical analysis and selecting our compressor sizing. But then, so does that make sense to everybody kind of at a high level? Hey, we're looking at this set of data, and we can turn it into a, a linear or a statistical analysis to get elimination of flaring events. So then the next part is, is OK, we've selected our capacity. Now what other equipment do we need? And the first thing we need to tie this in is we talked about that liquid seal. So Here's what that looks like. We've got our flare gas coming in. We've got a certain amount of water in the vessel. Um, and what our depth is, is from our point where our gas can come out to our water depth, that's what we call the liquid seal depth. So for a typical system, that's going to be like six inches, just a little bit of back pressure. When we go to flare gas recovery, because the band of six inches is so narrow, the compressors won't work within that band. We would. We would go over, and we'd flare, and we'd go under, and we'd pull a vacuum on the system. So we typically want 30 inches of water um, in the system. And so what that does is it gives us room to stage the compressors. So with 30 inches of water, I can set the compressor's operation at 20 inches of suction. I can draw it. If I get a big event, it'll go up, to, up some, and I can bring on another compressor. Or as the event subsides and it goes down some, I can turn a compressor off or adjust a recycle valve and stay at that operating point. If I get over 30 inches, everything's going to go to the flare. So I'm going to recover in our previous example of 2,000 ACFM. I'm going to recover up to 2,000. And then any event bigger than that is going to go through the liquid seal, and we're going to go to the flare. So our flare header pressure is going to increase and, and go to the flare. So this deep liquid seal gives us capacity control. It allows us to stage compressors. Um, and it gives us stable staging to both the compressors and the flare. So this is an example of a system that's not a deep liquid seal. So that small picture you see there is a system where it was small. And so what's happening there is we're purging through, and then the water seals again, and we come off. And then we pressure builds up. And we go through with a big puff, and then it comes off. And so you get this system where the water is going up and down, and you get this puffing effect, which is, and it can be really noisy as well, where it'll just flare real heavy and then go silent and then flare, and it, it can be very loud, um, like to the point where it rattles windows in a facility if it's big enough. And so we want to eliminate that. We don't want that to happen. And that's where that we put internals inside the liquid seal vessel to help some of that wave action and we smooth out the bubbles to where they don't create this big puffing effect. So a liquid seal vessel is important. It has to be there for flare gas recovery. And the depth of that liquid seal can be, we recommend 30 inches minimum, but it can be up to 60 or 120 inches, depending upon how far away from the flare the compressors are. What we're wanting is a certain pressure at the compressor and then we'll size the liquid seal or the piping accordingly to get that pressure. So now the kind of fun part is the compressors. So we can do a lot of different types of compression. Um, 
so the things we look at when we're selecting a compressor is a lot of customers have a preference. You know, we have all of these screw compressors in our facility, so we want another screw type compressor. But um, you're also looking at safety. Is it suitable for the process? Um, if you've got a, a, a lot of H2S, a certain type of compressor may not be suitable for the process. Um, they're looking at maintenance and repair requirements or capital requirements, um, and then reliability and maintenance also. So if you've got a really small facility who has a limited budget, they may not want to put in the top of the line Cadillac dry screw compressor. So they may go with a cheaper, simpler operating version. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the commonly used types of compressors for flare gas recovery systems over the next four or five slides. Um, but first, this is another good summary. It, it talks a little bit about the dust. So this is a, a flow rate on the bottom and a discharge pressure up the left-hand column. So, uh, you know, a reciprocating compressor can get us really high pressures, but it may not be suitable for certain types of gas compositions that we're getting. A liquid ring compressor is a pretty good system for um, flare gas recovery because it can do a discharge pressure of about 150 pounds, which is a typical fuel operating, and it works really well for varying compositions, high H2S, so that gets used quite a bit in, in these types of systems. So that's why this is probably the most popular. It's liquid ring compressors used in about 85% of the U.S. domestic flare gas recovery systems. Um, it's suitable for high process variability. So a flare is taking all of the waste streams. So we can have high hydrogen with low molecular weight one minute and a high um, butane composition or even heavier the next. And so we get these swings where it'll go from 40 weight molecular gas to 10 weight molecular gas. And the compressor has to be able to adapt to that. And a liquid ring compressor does that very, very well because once the gas stream is absorbed in the water, it, it doesn't really care what it sees. It's mainly water. Um, so it also works well for high temperature applications because the high amount of water creating the liquid ring um, like cools the gas off to whatever temperature it is, and that's what, so the heat of compression isn't very high. Um, so what's going to happen in a liquid ring system is our gas comes into the compressor, it mixes with our service liquid, and we discharge it to a three-phase separator. We separate the water, it goes back to the compressor. Any condensed hydrocarbons spill over and we take those to wherever the facility can use them. And then the recovered gas goes downstream for, for use as fuel or, or further treating or something like that. So these have discharge pressures up to about 170 pounds um, and then they have really high reliability. So a reciprocating compressor is another choice. Um, these are going to have higher discharge pressures, typically in the range of 300 pounds, but you could go to a three-stage compressor and get up to 600, 700 pounds of compression. These are going to work really well in applications where you're wanting to recover liquids. So you've got um, a process stream with maybe proteins, propanes or butanes. You're wanting to get up to 300 pounds and then cool it down to maybe... Oh, 80, 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit and condense the liquids to be able to use those as a feedstock. So this is, I've got an example of this later, but it, a facility where it's a propylene facility, we were wanting to recover liquid propylene to use back as feedstock for the facility. This uh, reciprocating compressor worked very, very well. Um, the downside here is um, if you have large swings in composition, you can overheat the compressor or send cold gas to the compressor and it not work. Like you don't get the condensables or you condense within the compressor. So you gotta have a lot of process control with a recip. A third type that gets used is a sliding vane. Um, these are gonna have a very similar pressure, discharge pressure to a, a liquid ring machine. Um, these are really simple in operation. It has a eccentric housing with a rotor in the middle. So as the gas comes in, it's the large side of the 
the eccentric housing, it gets compressed into the smaller side and discharged. And so the blades are kept out against the housing by the spinning mass. Um, there's like 12 parts inside of a reciprocating or a, inside of a sliding vane compressor. Um, the downside of these is they have higher operating noise and higher maintenance costs. So you're constantly wearing those blades within the compressor. They don't do well when you get high slugs of liquid. So if you've got an application where you're going to be bringing in a lot of liquids, you're going to wash the bearings and it's going to fail because it doesn't get enough lubrication. So there's some things you can do in design, but um, in general these are a little less reliable, less costly, so lower capital costs but higher maintenance costs. So um, these are going to get used for smaller facilities. They get used in offshore facilities quite a bit where space may be a premium and you don't have a lot of space for ancillary equipment. Because as you can see, we come into the compressor, we compress the gas and cool it, we're going to a vertical knockout. You can fit this package in a space about half the size of this room. A screw compressor is um, another type that gets used a lot, higher discharge pressures. Um, so this is where we've got the intermeshing gears on the screw. Again, similar topic as we reduce, or concept, as we reduce the space, we get compression of the gas. Um, these are going to have relatively small footprints, but they are higher. This is probably the most expensive of all of the um, compression technologies that you use for gas recovery. And then the last type that gets used often is an ejector. So these are a solid state. There's no rotating parts within this machine or within this type of compression. We're taking high pressure gas that's the motive force, our flare gas that's coming in at a low pressure, and as it goes through that nozzle, it just used Bernoulli's principle to compress our low pressure gas to an intermediate pressure between our high pressure gas, and we end up with something in the middle. Um, so these have a really small footprint. Um, so they can be put into really small spaces. They don't have any rotating parts, so there's no maintenance. Um, these work really well when you've got really corrosive gas because you can make them out of stainless steel for the whole equipment. The downside is, is you've got to have a high pressure, high flow motive force available to make it work. And a lot of times that's not available. So if you're in a facility that may have excess steam, you can use a steam eductor. If you had a lot of high pressure gas, like these get used in production environments where they're producing a lot of gas and they want to recover a small amount of flare gas to, and take it to an intermediate pressure for further separation, these are a great fit. Um, yeah, go ahead. How do you not get backflow? So, so, low pressure? so how does, so the high pressure is going to be going here and it's going to suck the low pressure in but then you're going to have a check valve at some point on your discharge side to keep any of it from flowing back the other direction. So what we're not showing is, is on the downstream side, there'll be some valves and instruments, and one of those will be a check to keep it all from back flowing the other direction. Is that kind of what you were asking? So that's the various compression technologies. Um, Integration into the facility is where it all kind of comes together, right? So we can have compressors and we can have flares and we can have all of these pieces of equipment, but you got to tie it all together. So in addition to the compressor, you're going to have to have some downstream equipment. You know, for the liquid ring machine, we talked about a separator and a cooler of some kind. Um, and so that's part of the flare gas package. But then this is a picture that shows like multiple flares with multiple liquid seal drums all coming to a single co-located flare gas recovery system. So making, sizing these liquid seals to the right depths, sizing all of this pipe, and then all of this equipment within the package is what makes the whole thing work. And so that's an area where as your, your site engineer or even your combustion engineers in the facilities will help and the flare gas recovery provider and the facility will work together to figure out, well, how do we make all of this work? And that's an area where, you know, as a process engineer working in a facility, you guys as engineers would get involved 
and, and kind of help that process. So this is where it kind of all gets tied together. Any questions about that or, or how that? This was an actual system in, I think, Texas. And so you can see there's three different um, flare gas recovery systems working here. Two flares were tied into one system. Two flares were tied into a third, second system. And then this one flare had its own independent flare gas recovery train. They had a, uh, the gases that were in the unit that fill, fed this flare they didn't want to commingle them with everything else, and so they kept that as an isolated, an isolated type of gas recovery plant. So we talked a little bit in addition to integration, well, we may have to treat the gas. So one thing that will happen is, is the amine, so a lot of facilities will have high H2S in their gas. And we don't want to send the H2S to the fuel system because then we're just passing that pollutant downstream. And so the flare gas recovery system will have an amine absorber or will send the gas through an amine treating before it goes to fuel. So this is an example where the gas was recovered and before it went to fuel, it went through an amine absorber. Um, and what came out of the absorber was sweet gas. And then the amine was sent to, in this particular example, the amine was sent to, they had enough capacity in their regen unit. Um, they didn't, so the tower was located at the facility, regen was everywhere else. But there will be systems where the amine absorber, the amine regen and everything associated with that, the thermal oxidizer and all of that will be co-located with the flare gas recovery system to where what's coming out of that whole process is sweet gas and um, recovered or uh, lean amine. So typically when we're looking at doing some type of, of absorption, we're trying to get the recovered gas down to less than 50 parts per million of H2S. And you also, you may need to remove CO2 also. So you, amine will do both of those um, at the same time. So that's a typical onshore gas recovery system. Offshore, um, as I said, this has become, in the last five or six years, we've seen more um, interest in offshore applications. So typically what's happening on a plant is you've got this whole unit where you're taking crude and making gasoline. In an offshore application, you're just getting oil and gas that's being produced, and at the offshore facility, they're doing separation of oil and gas. Um, and so to do that, they've got to depressurize um, the oil to get it to separate. And so then what happens is, is the recovered gases get put into a first stage compressor and they may use those for water in, or gas injection or some other process, but they also have vents off that process. And instead of flaring them, because they don't want a flare continuously operating, they are more and more trying to recover those. Another example is, is they've got crude oil tanks on board like an FPSO. Well, as they fill those crude oil tanks, they push out the vent gases, and as, they, as the tanks go down, they pull, they, they pull in air, so they kind of breathe, um, or they put a blanket on top. So then as they fill that crude oil tank, that blanket's got to go somewhere, and right now it may go to atmosphere, but if you've got any... Um, combustible gases in that mixture, you've got a live flare operating, now you've got an explosive environment. And so they've kind of done through some HAZOPs and said, wait a minute, we need to be recovering those crude oil vents. So in addition to the process for the separation, they want to recover the crude oil, or the vents off the crude oil tank. So, and in, particularly in the North Sea, they want to operate this with a closed flare. So they don't want to flare with a pilot, they want to be able to turn the flare off so this is an example of a system with a high pressure and a low pressure. The flare's not operating, there's no pilot there, and all of the recovered gases are going into a gas recovery system of some kind. It could be anything. It could be a ejector, it could be a oil flooded screw. It doesn't really matter the compressor type, but we're recovering it and again using it as fuel. So they've got instead of a liquid seal, they've got 
quick opening valve. So valves that can open within three to five seconds to where as pressure builds on this line, they've got a, a pressure sensor that if the pressure reaches a set point, we're going to open that valve and allow that gas to go to the flare. When you do that, we've got to light that flare. So we'll talk about how all of this happens. Um, but in this instance, we've reached our set point. We open this quick opening valve. We light the flare either through a ballistic system of some kind or some other ignition. And now we have a flare that's burning. And so that's part of the integration of flare gas recovery in an offshore package is, is all of, instead of a liquid seal here that's just a mechanical device, all of this stuff has to work together and it's more controls heavy, which is not a mechanical engineer's high point. I mean, I'm like, give me systems and when it comes control oriented, it's kind of like, okay, that's somebody else's job. But um, there's these large systems that can integrate all of this. And so this is where for John Zink and, and other companies that do this, we can provide the flare, we can provide all of this controls and quick opening valve systems, and then we can provide the flare gas recovery system. So we'll show you some pictures of what a land-based system will look like here in a minute, but this is a good picture of an offshore package. So an offshore platform space is at a high premium, so we're trying to package all of this into as small a space as possible. Um, and so it becomes a much tighter proposition to make that happen. Um, we talked a little bit about this quick opening and the, in, the ignition system. I just wanted to go, there's kind of two ways that this happens. Historically, there's been a ballistic pellet. Um, so imagine, you know, the, the real crude example is, I forget, was it somebody that lit the Olympic torch three or four years ago where they used an arrow and they shot the arrow up and it landed in the top of the cauldron up there. Um, that would be a really crude way to light a flare. But this is similar to that in that instead of shooting an arrow, you've got a pipe. And there's a pellet that goes through that pipe. And when it hits a plate at the flare, it sends sparks all over the place. So this is a way where, if from this picture, okay, I've sensed that I've got enough pressure. I'm going to open this valve and wait for that flare gas to get to this flare. And when there's enough of it there to light, I'm going to send my pellet to ignite that gas. So that's basically what this ballistic pellet ignition system does. And I wish I had a cool video of how that happens, but I don't. So imagine a pipe um, and sparks going out all over the place. And then if we time it wrong and we don't get enough gas or it's not combustible, we don't light the flare, or if we get too much gas and it's concentrated around that flare and we hit it with sparks, we get a nice boom. So there's, this is, it has its positives and it works and it's worked for the last 20 years, but it's not necessarily the safest way to light a flare and it has some drawbacks and that timing is really, really important. So one of the things John Zink and we have done is we've created a way to get flare gas or pilot gas to the pilot in the same amount of time it takes that pellet to get there. So rather than shooting the pellet and lighting flare gas, we're figuring out a way to get the fuel gas to the pilot to light the pilot within three seconds. Um, the historic challenge has been in this pilot, there's a really small orifice. So when you close this valve, this all fills with air. And then as you open that valve, all of that fuel has got to push that air out, and it takes about 25 seconds to light that pilot. So if we're wanting to do it within three seconds, we had to do it more quickly. So we created this um, gas delivery system that allowed us to quickly evacuate the air, fill that fuel line and that pilot with fuel within five seconds to light the pilot. The pilot, in turn, then lights the flare. So this is an alternative way to do quick ignition. Um, the advantage here is if I light it early, it doesn't do any harm. All I've done is light the pilot. We've done a pilot test. I can turn that fuel back off, and I haven't wasted a $1,000 pellet mechanism of some kind. Um, the other upside is, is they have to have these pilots anyway, and so they're already there. Adding a delivery system you can do with a minimal cost, but give them a lot more flexibility in how they operate. So that's 
an integration of the ignition system with the flare gas recovery system as well as the controls to make that work. So this is a picture of an offshore flare gas recovery system. To give you a kind of a feel for the scope, that's about, it's 5 meters by 12 meters, so 15 feet by um, 30, roughly 25 feet long. This is about 14 feet tall. Um, this is two liquid ring compressors with a vertical separator and all of our controls and, and instrumentation. I'll show you a picture of what this would look like in a land-based system here in just a minute. Um, same pieces of equipment, just installed in a different way. This would be a sliding vane package. So we talked a little bit about sliding vane compressors. Um, they're a little hard to see, but this is one compressor and motor, a second compressor and motor, and then our inlet knockout and our discharge knockouts. So this package is about 10 feet wide by about 30 feet long, packaged for an offshore application. So this is an example of a liquid ring system in a refinery. Um, we've got two liquid ring compressors, an air-cooled exchanger, an inlet knockout, a horizontal separator on the bottom. This one's a little bit unique because this particular customer wanted to be able to duplicate the system um, for future growth. So what you see next to it is a space for two more compressors and the whole system completely duplicated. So we, as designers, we knew we had this whole brown plot space to work in and we had to squeeze two systems in from the up front even though we were only supplying half of that package. This is an example of a four compressor system. Instead of air coolers, we're using shell and tubes. Um, one of the interesting things here is this was an existing building that we had to work around. So everything was designed, um, one of the things about the flare gas recovery systems is, is they tend to be very specific to a customer. So customer specification driven, customer plant driven, everybody has a different plot space. One person's plot may be the size of this room, one person's may be the size of the football field. And so what they want to do and how they want to do it um, varies. This example uses shell and tube coolers. This customer had um, cooling water available. The previous customer was, was air-cooled, so it, it didn't have those utilities available. Um, this is an example of a system that's just more spread out. This would be still the compressor deck here. The compressors are elevated so that they process-wise they work right, but just some examples of how they can differ um, in the amount of equipment and the way they're laid out. So this is a three compressor system, air-cooled exchanger, separator, inlet knockout in here somewhere, um, and I don't, I'm not sure what that other piece of equipment is on the inlet side, but um, you can see they get Again, it's a little bit, each one's a little bit different. This is a package where the customer had limited plot space. They wanted everything to come pre-assembled. So rather than like here where these compressors are on concrete pedestals with this big platform, um, here we mounted the compressors low and all of this is on one structural base to where we could bring it in and set it down and drastically save them time on their, their field installation costs. And, and timing. So this customer had a particular need to do things quickly. They didn't want a lot of field installation time. And so um, we designed the package uh, to meet their needs. So we talked a little bit about, um, and this runs into the case study, the use of all these other pictures were of sliding or liquid ring compressors. This one is a reciprocating compressor application. So this particular customer wanted to recover um, liquids for storage. So they were, it was a gas plant, and they were getting a lot of propanes and butanes, and they wanted to recover those as liquids and put them into their, their storage tanks um, to be able to use for feedstock or to sell. And so we were compressing up to about 250 pounds, and then we were, it was going through a chiller. Um, it had a couple stages of cooling, um, and a chiller here where we were using um, liquid 
propylene at negative 40 degrees to bring the process down to about 30 degrees Fahrenheit to get the maximum amount of liquid recovery. So these black boxes, or the big boxes here are a chiller package, um, and then this is the power to drive all of that, the motor starter building. But So all of this equipment that you see not in the boxes was part of the flare gas recovery system. So this is some pictures of um, systems actually in the field. This is, if you remember that picture with the five flares where we talked about the integration, that's the flare gas recovery unit and what it actually looked like when it was installed. So that's about the length of a football field. It's about 90 yards long. So not a small, not a small system. Here's two, two compressors with the liquid seal drum installed in the field. That's a good picture of all of the equipment in one place. Um, so here's a case study. Uh, we had a customer who, similar to the, they were a propylene plant. They wanted to recover all of the liquid propylene that was, or gassed off propylene that was venting to their flare. Their flare stream was about 80% propylene, 15% nitrogen, and 5% other stuff. And so for them, what they were making was propylene pellets. And so they were taking propylene liquids and then they were making the pellets that get used to make milk cartons and water bottles and, and all of that type of stuff. And so that's their feedstock. And so for every, if you're venting 80% of that, or what you're venting, if 80% of that is propylene, they saw the flare as dollar bills getting burned because everything that was going to the flare wasn't being made into sellable product. And so when they came to us, they said, hey, is there any way we could recover this? They had no EPA, no environmental agency was driving what they did. This was a purely capital savings type project. And so what they told us was, is we have suction of about 16 pounds absolute, so just over atmospheric, 30 inch liquid seal at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we want to recover it to 315 pounds absolute or 300 pounds and 115 degrees Fahrenheit to use as feedstock. And they wanted to recover it, well, sorry, we wanted to recover it to 315 to get it, make it liquid. And then we wanted to send it to their process at 1,355 pounds. So their capacity that was coming in was about somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 million standard cubic feet per day of gas. So that's a, about 1,000 cubic feet per minute. Um, and they were going to be able to recover at that 80% propylene, we were going to recover about 30 gallons per minute of liquid propylene. So we were going to fill a separator that's relatively large about every hour. And then they were going to take that and recover it back to their feedstock. So what we looked at was, was well, what are the right type of compressor? Um, being able to get the liquids, we knew we were in a reciprocating compressor. The customer was good with that because they had other recips in their facility. They knew the supplier that we would work with. Um, and so then, so we were recovering. Um, we did two uh, compressor skids, a uh, air cooler, air cooled exchangers, and then this recovery skid here that had the, a separator and two pumps. And so as we recovered the gas, we came out of the separator from the pumps and then that went back to their feedstock. And so um, this was all supplied by John Zink and packaged, um, installed in a facility. And then the, at the end of the day, the, the customer was recovering, um, again, the, the propylene that they wanted for their feedstock. And, and I think that project, um, at the end of the day, paid for itself within about 12 to 18 months. Um, this is probably a three to $4 million capital cost for the equipment, another two to three million dollars for for the installation in the facility. So their savings, their all of their expenses for the project of six million dollars paid for itself within about six or within about eighteen months of recovered product. So for them, they were pretty pretty happy with the outcome of that that particular project. 
So what we, and again, just to kind of restate, what we would have gotten would have been these initial site conditions, and then what do you want to do with it at the end of the day? And as a group of engineers, we had to figure out, well, what do we put in between the two and make that presentation back to the customer? So any, I guess that's all I have. I know you guys said till 1.15. I didn't push too hard to make that, but um, let's, if you got any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer those or if there's anything that you saw that you were like, wait a minute, I didn't understand or you piqued an interest, um, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Everybody's like, no, dude, I just want to get out of here because you gave me 15 minutes of my life back. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Good luck. The clap was for being done earlier. I know. Now for my my skills.